165th Contact. Monday, March 8, 1982, 8.30 am. Quetzal says unfortunately, it has now become Monday, even though I wanted to come to you no later than yesterday. Billy says that's not bad, for through this, I encountered a question that seems important to me. Quetzal says what does it concern? Billy says last Friday, you spoke of the matters of the center and of yourself as well as of your people, concerning the fact that a vibration endangers you here, and it slowly makes it impossible for you to be able to come here. But now, it's hit me that you were already often in the house, in the office or even in the lounge with me, but still, you haven't had any problems. Quetzal says that is of correctness. I have given you no explanation about that. But it is, in fact, the case that walls and glass, etc., strongly absorb the earth human vibrations, which lowers the risk for us that we lose control. But now, this doesn't mean that the danger is averted through this because in truth, it only decreases, which is why we must protect ourselves from the consequences with our protective devices. Moreover, the small devices are completely sufficient for this, but only for our short time, while in this connection, my large device grants absolute security for several hours when I am surrounded by protective walls. Billy says but then, I don't understand, at that time, Semiaza. Quetzal says we all trusted in the reason of the group members, which is why we never had our protective devices in operation in the Sahar Center. Billy says oh, I see. Quetzal says that was so, yes unfortunately. Billy says but I see, in accordance with your explanation, that your device can also be dangerous because if walls and glass strongly absorb the vibrations, then the distances also have to collapse, according to which the device then only reacts much later when someone comes. So it could be that you are standing behind a wall, etc. and then suddenly, someone comes around the corner after which then, the catastrophe will be baked. Quetzal says that is of correctness. You have recognized the facts exactly as they are? Billy says now I first understand the things correctly. Quetzal says it also shouldn't be necessary to explain more about that, so I can now speak of those concerns, on account of which I observed your meeting as well as a few other things on Saturday, as I already told you on Friday. Billy says I'm curious about that. By the way, we should find a solution, so that the meetings don't last as long. Long sessions are tiring for the people. Quetzal says I have already often made this observation, unfortunately, because if the group members will truly be interested in the issues to be discussed, those that are related to the group tasks, then neither fatigue nor inattentiveness will be appearing. Hence, for my part, I think that the meetings should be carried out as before, but the discussions must be laid out in more rational forms. The individuals talk too long and also incoherently in relation to a topic. It becomes, as a rule, deviated into extreme things and into areas that are not related to the agenda. The interest, however, must generally become better, as well as the will for this fulfillment of duty. Like with us. Such meetings also take place on the earth every day in all possible areas, and these meetings, as a rule, last much longer than yours. But also with these meetings, no one can be disinterested, inattentive, abusive to duty, or of will less fatigue. Thus, the group members should also finally satisfy their duty in this respect. Billy says then I must also look for no other solution and can immediately raise a question Elizabeth complained to me yesterday that she always has difficulties with the meditation because she becomes regularly attacked by a racing pulse and racing heart, etc. I couldn't give her any information concerning this, however, because I didn't know where it comes from. That is, I only see one possibility as to when such symptoms arise but I am not sure if this is actually so. In my opinion, it can only be the case that Elizabeth generates rather bad vibrations through her whole being as you mentioned this once, which are trying to be neutralized by the entire circle. Nevertheless, 
The still weak selfishness and power craze of Elizabeth defends itself against this by all means, but it is senseless and pointless because the whole circle has much greater forces than those that she can raise herself. So through this, she is subject to her own outbursts, which generates excitement in her and a racing heart as well as a racing pulse. Quetzal says that is of correctness, if it is actually like what she says. Her domineering nature must react in such a way, but it doesn't go against the forces of the circle because these fight illogical force against this negative, corrupt state in her. Her habit of influencing others with her very negative vibrations fails here miserably and strikes back at her, which, by the way, will also appear to a much greater extent with Ingrid, even though up to now, she has apparently made no such remarks toward you. But the fact that also with her, very strong and even degenerative defense reactions appear with the meditation, this is not to be dismissed out of hand because an inspection specifically carried out by me for this purpose has revealed this fact. Ingrid is, in fact, very strongly affected by a craze for domination which expresses itself much more strongly than what is noticeable with Elizabeth toward the children. Until now, Never have I experienced that children indulge so unnaturally, extensively, and intensively in agonizing crying as what is the case with Ingrid with her children and with those of Elizabeth. Their domineering vibrations particularly affect the small children in such a way that they feel excruciating pains in their emotional centers, which are so intense that they often cry. But this also carries over to the other children, which is usually only expressed. However, when they are no longer in the center, where their sufferings have vanished through the neutralizing vibrations prevailing here. Particularly Ingrid gives no thoughts to these concerns because she is still so biased in old, false and crazy teachings that she doesn't recognize the truth and, therefore, wrongfully looks elsewhere for the causes, namely at Elizabeth and at the group members of the center. But in truth. These causes do not lie with Elizabeth but with herself. But not only in reference to the children is this so but also with regard to Elizabeth and her husband Ferdinand, who are strongly affected by these influences, and Ingrid still always misleads them into wrong actions and animates them to do works that do not fall within their work areas. In this respect, Ingrid must learn very quickly to discard this behavior and to begin working herself. She has to fulfill her own duties herself, while Elizabeth and her husband fulfill theirs. It isn't right that Ingrid only exercises a role of an idle woman, while Elizabeth and her husband or her child Melanie must perform her works. With us, who are much further developed in these matters, such machinations cannot and may not appear. Therefore, I will concern myself with preparing a daily work plan for Ferdinand, according to which he should work in the future, in which case he then has to ignore all animating suggestions of Ingrid toward the performance of the activities assigned to her as a woman. A man has his own duties, and so does a woman, and these are to be fulfilled by those concerned. And with that, I'm back at Elizabeth, who should continue to fulfill the duty with regard to the meditation, even if it isn't pleasing to her. Only through this will she learn in this respect to suppress her weak, domineering emotions because there is no other way for her to do this. Thus the meditation must be imposed on her as the most urgent duty. And concerning her smallest child and also Ingrid's, I must, regrettably, still say that also the food leaves very much to be desired, for not enough nutritious energizing, and solid food is given to these children. In particular, it traces back to the initiative of Ingrid who, even in these respects, raises very strange and unrealistic thoughts and ideas that have a harmful effect. Very often, she also searches for the blame somewhere outside of herself, when she suffers from disturbing influences and vibrations, after which she then assumes that outside, negative vibrations have befallen her and influence her negatively. But that truly isn't the case with her, except when she, as well as Ferdinand, fall into their extremely negative, self-magnificence craze. Ingrid should thoroughly indulge herself once in your very well described facts of the spiritual teaching, in which you have described the adversary's powers and their effects exceptionally well.
These self-adversary powers and delusion-believing ideas of Ingrid alone are what very often influence her negatively. Billy says I have already told Ferdinand myself that I will work out a daily work plan with him, according to which he should then act. With that, it just comes to my mind that he has asked me about his coming here on Saturdays, when he has to work on his farm. As a farmer, he needs this time on nice days because this business brings with it that nice weather must be used for cultivation, according to which he can't always be in the center on Saturdays. Quetzal says I have thought about this, and if these interests have prospered with him so far, then it is self-evident that he only has to appear each Sunday at the time of the meditation circle, but he and also Ingrid have to respect that they arrive at the center at least one hour before the beginning of the meditation. But still, that's not the extent of it, and moreover, old traditional difficulties arise with Ferdinand's parents, who can bring a lot into question. His parents are inconsistent in their honesty and in all their senses, which is why new difficulties have now arisen with regard to the property sale. Billy says crap but I've already heard something similar. But I think we've now discussed this topic enough. I myself still have a few things that I would like to discuss with you. Quetzal says that do you hear that? Someone is out there in front of your workroom. Billy says yes, I hear it. It seems to be at land. Funny, it sounds as if he's right in front of the office. But I think that I've locked the outer door. I'll check. Quetzal says I'll go away in the meantime and come back in 30 minutes. Billy says okay. Billy says it really was at land. Beetle was so intelligent to let the little elf into the new aviary where he then opened the door to the inner room and shouted around inside. Really very smart of Eva, because she had known, nevertheless, that you are here. Quetzal says that is of correctness. Billy says she says that I am to apologize to you for her. Quetzal says I give her no reproach, but we talked about these things at the very beginning, also of the fact that Semiaza became injured by such carelessness and neglect of duty. The same could have now happened to me here, if I didn't have my protective device with me, because the distance to the seat of the house from here is very short. It is, therefore, incomprehensible that such incidents occur again and again. If we have our devices in operation, then there is likely no danger for us, but something can fail once with these devices and then it happens. Unfortunately, our respective devices still aren't developed so far that we can rely on them in every respect and with absolute certainty, other than this device here which still needs some improvements and developments, everything is still far too unwieldy and difficult to transport. Billy says it is, indeed, a sizable bucket. Quetzal says that is of correctness, and that is why I'm trying hard to bring the device to handier forms. Billy says which you will certainly manage to do, as I know you. Quetzal says indeed, but now to other things. You are very interested in the matters of the dark cloud that moves around the earth, which is why I have dealt with this in more detail and have found out that it is already incorporated into a process of change that lets it largely become liquid matter, particularly sulfur-containing substances which originated from the ash and dust particles and the steam particles of the earth which are suspended at these heights. In particular, this concerns sulfur-containing substances that move invisible to the eye at these altitudes and that are, nevertheless, also emission products of the earth and come about, for example, through volcanic eruptions and rises steam-like masses into the atmosphere and stratosphere as well as ionosphere, etc. Billy says aha, so it's practically a process like the one from which the clouds originate. But tell me, the scientists now actually claim that this cloud has its origin on the earth and, thus, with an unknown volcano of enormous proportions. Although you said that such would have had to have been detected by seismology devices, Nevertheless, couldn't it be that this cloud not only comes from Jupiter's moon Io but that it is also mixed with the substances of some volcanic eruption on Earth, which was simply somewhat smaller than what could have been seismically detected? 
Quetzal says no, that possibility isn't given because for the production of this cloud, a volcanic eruption that quaked with the strength of 11 values on the Richter scale was necessary, as we could clearly determine. Only through this strength was it also possible that this ash cloud of dust could be hurled so far from the gravitational field of Jupiter's moon Io that it was able to go away from it and drift toward the Earth. We could also measure the total weight of the cloud, and this is really abnormally large, namely no less than 1.37 million tons. Billy says that is, indeed, incredible, but I don't understand why such an ash cloud of dust doesn't become compressed and practically seen as a meteorite or the like, for in my opinion, such a cloud would have to be forced into a raging rotation, on the one hand, through the eruptive force and, on the other hand, through the sudden drop in temperature in free space, by what means it would have to compress itself spirally bit by bit. Quetzal says that is of correctness, and moreover, it is a phenomenon that is still unknown to the earthly scientists. In order to explain these processes surrounding this cloud to you more closely, I must be a little more detailed, after which you will then also understand why this hasn't been concentrated into a meteorite on the one hand, such a concentration onto agglomerated and compressed matter takes a very long time, which must be measured with many thousands of years or even millions of years or at least hundreds of thousands of years, depending on the type and state of the respective overall mass of the dust-filled or gaseous object, but on the other hand, the speed and temperature of the respective object also play a very important role. Now, if the type of the substance is such that through the zero temperature of free space, it immediately freezes to the heat form, which in the case of the Billy says a question in between by, zero temperature, you probably mean the zero point of space, which we designate as absolute zero, so therefore 273 degrees below zero or something. There could be misunderstandings in this regard because with us, it is maintained and determined by science that the zero point is where the forces divide, so where plus and minus begin, so thus the zero from where values begin to increase with plus one degree up to infinity and from where values begin to decrease with minus one degree down to minus 273.5 degrees Celsius. Quetzal says that is very right, my explanation regarding the zero temperature refers to the totality of the negative value, which isn't uniform throughout the whole universe. However, and neither of the appearances of light or of the colors in their respective positive or negative values. Billy says right, but that probably goes too far because we can hardly make it understandable to the human beings of Earth that the colors and light known to them also exist in negative values, that there are still many other colors than what the human being knows, just as there is also black light, which, unfortunately, seems crazy to the human beings of Earth. But now, it would be just as difficult if we wanted to explain, as you said, that something immediately freezes to the heat form. This might also be incomprehensible to the human beings of Earth because only a few can understand that starting from a certain point of deep cold, the phenomenon of plasma destruction through cold combustion occurs, through which specifically forms of protoplasm, etc. actually burn through cold heat, like, for example, what cold fire also does, which you demonstrated to me on the great journey. Quetzal says that is all of correctness, which is why we should also omit further explanations. Not even scientists of the earth who are well oriented on this would understand our remarks. At any rate, in the case of the aforementioned cloud, it was such that the ash dust particles ejected by the volcano of Io immediately froused to the heat form through the zero temperature of free space because together with the actual ash dust, which is a thousand times finer than the ash particles of volcanoes, hundreds of thousands of kilograms of sulfur compounds and other chemical compounds, which were vaporized by magma, reached into free space and cooled down there in a flash and became the finest crystals. At the same time, the cooling occurred so quickly that they didn't clump together and, therefore, could move as an open cloud through space to the earth, where they then underwent a renewed chemical change through the chemical elements prevailing here.
which orbit the planet at all altitudes. To our knowledge, this cloud moving through space was also registered by the devices of the American NASA, which were sent to Jupiter and Saturn, etc., but the authoritative scientists couldn't do anything with the mysterious messages of their apparatuses when they received these from their devices. Billy says by that you probably mean the Voyager probes? Quetzal says that is of correctness. Billy says haven't you announced recently, however, that several volcanoes erupted on the Earth and hadn't been registered by the seismographs? Quetzal says that, too, is of correctness, but the aforementioned cloud stands in no connection with that. The eruptions were much too small for them to have been able to be registered by the most sensitive devices on Earth. One of these eruptions was on the continent of Africa, one in the Russian wilderness, another in the vast seas of Oceania, one in the Asian region, and the last in the pre-zones of Antarctica. Billy says man, that's a whole series and no one should have actually noticed anything. Quetzal says that is not of correctness. I spoke of the fact that the scientists made no relevant findings from the aforementioned volcanic eruptions with their seismological devices. Otherwise, several of the eruptions were observed very well, but only by Earth human beings of a non-scientific nature, which is why also nothing became known about that. Billy says now I understand, but tell me, the Russians have now, once again, sent two probes to Venus and, at the same time, also garnered soil material. If they can now actually examine it, what will come of it? Quetzal says it won't be very much, but still a very good and great success for the Earth scientists. Their devices will not be of long durability on the planet Venus because they are not built for the extreme temperatures there. Billy says they cannot, indeed, because about 500 degrees of heat prevail there on the planet. After a short time, the things lie lame. But once they can actually get the rocks into the probes and examine them they will have to have gotten those of the bedrock because the surface layers were torn off by the space suction that took place around two or three years ago in all, right? Quetzal says you really think of everything. Yes. They will collect and analyze the bedrock, but there are still large areas of the surface layers of the planet, despite the gigantic suction at that time. Billy says then it should now also no longer be a duty to be silent about the truth of the planet Venus, and it can be said that it concerns a planet which stands only a second time in the last phases of its development, after which, in a few hundred thousand years, or in a few million years at the latest, depending on the external influences, it will awaken to faunal surface life, which is to say that it will then develop and carry primeval world life, soon after which animals will then emerge there, as it happens on every planet of a similar nature. Quetzal says once again, you take my explanations away from me. Billy says all right, then the fairy tales and cover-ups surrounding the truth of the planet Venus can and may finally be forgotten? Quetzal says that is so. Billy says good, then I would also like to mention that you've explained to me once that already millions of years ago, four or five of these, Venus had brought the transformation point behind itself through which magma lava outlets have formed the ground's crust and this was then strengthened. Now, after this process, as you have explained, only the surface transformation will take place, which, on the one hand, will result from the collection of space debris, like dust, acids and other chemical compounds, shooting stars, meteorites, and many other substances and elements, etc., but on the other hand, the remaining part will also take place out of the planet itself and from its surface, through underground volcanic upheavals and corrosion phenomena, etc. through this, so I remember, as you said to me, the whole surface of the planet will continue to grow and, on the other hand, compress inward, through which, again through renewed transformations and corrosion, an outer court layer will slowly but surely arise, which itself will begin to develop many kinds of amino acids once the right state is reached, after which the first life of flora will then find its beginning, 
which will then soon be followed by the higher floral state of life and then the first fauna-like life. But this will still take a few hundred thousand years or, in the longest case, a few million years, as you've said. If I still remember correctly, you've explained that the Earth also had to go through this development and that the outer layer of the Earth's crust at that time, as it is now currently given on Venus, already lay at a depth of many kilometers. Consequently, it can be assumed that if the present upper crust of Venus is dropped to about 5,30s to 10,30s meters of depth and is increased with new material then the first life begins to be created, right? Quetzal says that is of correctness, but to my knowledge, we haven't given you any information about that. Billy says that's true, but according to Adam Rees, I can put two and two together. Quetzal says by that, you mean to say that you have found out the correctness using the data given to you and through your own cognitive work and combining work? Billy says you see, that is of correctness, my son. Quetzal says that doesn't surprise me, for I know only too well that you always think over our words and explanations extremely thoroughly and then rummage through everything for so long, until you either find an actual and true solution or until you don't know any more and then ask us for the results. But now, it is that time again, my friend. I will already visit you again tomorrow or the next night. Billy says you are in a great hurry why? Quetzal says if you please, I want to take you out into space, in order to make the planetary alignment clear to you, which causes so much incomprehensible excitement among the Earth human beings. Billy says oh, I see, yes, I didn't think of that. I've tried to bring some reason among the human beings in this regard, but the newspapers and magazines, etc. have neither noted nor published my articles. They just can't make any money with the truth, which is why they only set forth senseless and false prophetic nonsense of pseudo-astrologers, pseudo-clairvoyants, and other charlatans and conjurers, whereby they also still mistakenly involve Nostradamus among and with these and maintain that he already prophesied the same nonsense even then, even though not a word of this is true and his gloomy prophecies that include planetary phenomena relate to completely different events which still lie far in the future. But over and over again, these twits and would-be experts of Nostradamus prophecies appear, who then claim that they have found the key to unraveling his prophecies, particularly because certain events of the world are repeated again and again, and so then, these lunatics are misled to accept that a prophecy had been devised for such an event. This is best seen with the events of Napoleon's time, with the events of the First and Second World War, and with the running time since then. Nevertheless, every possible and impossible prophecy of Nostradamus is actually pressed into these events, even though they don't describe these incidents at all and these are to be found in other centuries. But the cunning fraudsters make millions with this and become stinking rich through this. It really is a shame, and indeed, a rather damned one. Quetzal says you are excited, my friend. Billy says ha, should I not be about that? Quetzal says exactly, should you not be about that? I think that you do, indeed, have the right to that, my friend. Billy says again, you talk too much, you elf. I better go before you come to say that Nostradamus was a wonder boy. Quetzal says good smoke, my friend and he is that for me even today, and I feel devilishly much respect, reverence, and love for him. Billy says see, see, you can suddenly use rather hearty expressions to hide your emotions. But that doesn't work with me, you sentimental type. Quetzal says it's probably better if we part now. Till we meet again. Billy says so, see it through, then bye bye, till tomorrow or the next day but maybe it would be good if you would learn a few swear words in the meantime. Bye. The End